Welcome to today's lunchtime webinar. I should apologize for a bit of background noise. They're digging up the road outside our offices. Uh, so welcome to today's webinar, all about the Big Biodiversity Challenge. Uh, with one month to go before the deadline, this webinar will hopefully provide not only some inspiration to those seeking to enter, it'll also provide some handy hints and tips for your entries. And now in its sixth year, the Big Biodiversity Challenge is an initiative to raise awareness of how biodiversity needs to become a key component within the construction industry as an integrated part of planning and delivering projects. Uh, for more information, you can always go to the Big Biodiversity Challenge website, which is www.bigchallenge.info. So this is today's uh, program. Uh, we've got uh, four presenters, uh, three award winners and a judge. They'll talk you through their projects, and Rosie will conclude by giving you some information and some handy hints that the judges will be uh, looking at when they come to assessing all of the entries. Just to say that you, this webinar is being recorded as well, uh, so you can re-watch it if you please. And there will be questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can see a questions box. If you can use that to submit your questions, I'll then direct the question to the relevant presenter. So remember, if you do have a question to uh, put who you're addressing that question to, you can type that in at any point and I'll make a note of them and we'll go through any questions at the end of the webinar. So without any further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to Jamie, who's today's first presenter. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm just going to briefly talk to you about um, becoming the biodiversity champion. Uh, for 2018, which was uh, obviously a great honour, and um, it's something that's sort of opened my eyes and, and Kia's eyes um, to what can be achieved if we put our minds to it. Um, I'm obviously very uh, grateful for, for the uh, for the nomination and, and being voted uh, champion, but also feel slightly guilty that it's uh, an individual award and not something as a, a team award because the, the project we worked on was a, very much a team team event and team effort. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit now about the project itself, which was um, this Bristol Water Pipeline project carrying um, clean water from two reservoirs, so from the north and south of Bristol, um, to uh, basically supply water to another 280,000 homes um, and a pipeline of just over 30 kilometres. So a large swathe of, of the north Somerset and, and a little bit of Somerset countryside to work on. Um, very demanding project in the respect that um, the, the delivery time for it was cut short by planning permission um, not being granted in, in the expected time period. Um, off what then wouldn't allow a change in the um, completion date for the project. So the whole project was condensed by six months, uh, which in itself is, is quite a challenge. Um, got here is uh, a few pictures of the team. Um, so when we started the project, uh, it was just myself working in, in Kia Utilities. Um, and um, we, we brought in uh, Grace Burge, who's uh, the young lady putting the face in the middle at the bottom. Um, she's a local, uh, local ecologist who worked with us for many years on, on various projects uh, and seems an ideal fit to come in and look after the project itself. Um, Rosie, who's the uh, young lady next to her, uh, she joins the graduate placement for the project um, and has now stayed with us. Uh, and then there's Craig there as well, who joined us as a part of an acquisition. Um, and was travelling to Norfolk to help out on, on various things. So I think what I'm trying to say is uh, a, a, a small team grew quite quickly, um, lots of hard work, lots of enthusiasm uh, and lots of fun um, and lots and lots of hours put into what we did. Um, so this, the project itself was obviously a, a very large scheme um, with a whole host of issues. Um, all kinds of environmental issues from uh, archaeology, finding Roman burials, which is shown in the picture on the bottom right hand side there, um, trees and hedgerows, those 200 hedgerow crossings, like 400 mature or veteran trees along the pipe route, um, numerous protected and important species, numerous invasive species, 
and lots of other things that as a company and, and our client Mr Water were, were hoping that we could engage with the uh, local communities uh, and charity groups and do some, some good corporate responsibility work. Um, so some of the species that we had on, on site were great crested newts. Um, we had six kilometres of newt fencing and, and several hundred pitfall traps in each of them daily for several months. Um, we had in recent 20, 30 hedges with uh, dormice in, so constraints and licenses in that. Um, a tunnel with several species of bats um, uh, and hedgerow either moving that were used as bat origin corridors. Um, numerous badger sets. Um, the tunnel I mentioned had cave spiders, two species of cave spider. Um, one is very rare, um, and a, a locally significant population of bee orchids. So lots and lots of things that we had to consider, um, as well as a, a variety of invasive plants, both terrestrial and, and aquatic, um, as you can see listed there. Uh, and really my, my reason for, for mentioning all of that is um, the project in itself it, it was enormous um, and took an awful, awful lot of effort. But, what we wanted to do was take it beyond being a good project and make it something quite memorable uh, and certainly leave a legacy behind it. So um, I sort of explain some of the things that we did that, um, that made it stand out and, and led to, to this award. Um, so the first thing is the Citizen Science Owl project. Um, we wanted to put up an owl box for each kilometre of the pipeline. Not necessarily every kilometre, but for average amount where the habitat was suitable. Uh, so we worked with the client and with the Hawk and Owl Trust, who gave us advice and the site, uh, and gave us some information on what we needed to, to, how to build boxes and, and where to site them. Um, and in the end, we put up, uh, it was 30 barn owl boxes, it's now 31. Uh, put another one up last week, uh, and six little owl boxes. Uh, five pestle boxes as well. Um, to, to try and increase the local population size. Um, we didn't make the boxes ourselves. We, we sourced the wood. Some of it was reused from sites and it was brought in new. Um, but we engaged with the local secondary school and the local college uh, and helped them weave uh, the, the box making into their curriculum for um, countryside management and, um, and things like that, which brought another element. So lots of children or students coming in and um, coming to site to sort of a site visit, um, getting them to, to, to build the boxes. Um, and there's a lot of talk around that as well with them. Uh, and it's been very successful. Um, Kia staff put the, the boxes up, and within six months, our first survey, we found two owls in boxes um, and another three boxes with signs of occupation for mouse. So it's um, a perfect start for what we, we wanted, really. Uh, and we'll continue surveying those boxes for, for at least five years to come. Um, second project we, we, we started um, with Bristol Water uh, and Avon Wildlife Trust as a, a project that had previously run with Bristol Water, but had run out of funding and had run out of um, momentum, really. And it's something that we were keen to get involved with and, and we engage the local schools. So we, we chose five schools along the, the pipeline route um, and we delivered uh, fish tanks to them uh, and brought elvers in um, for the children to, to look after for five weeks. Uh, part of that five weeks there were uh, we had classroom sessions delivered by the Wildlife Trust with clear support in them on eel ecology, uh, water management, um, and, and general issues around eels and how they can and can't pass through various features that we now have in the way. Uh, and it's it, something that the children loved, the teachers loved, and, and the Kia team loved doing as well. Uh, something very valuable. And we continue doing it. So we did it last year and we've just started to help again with it this year. So it's, it's gone beyond just helping with this project, which is nice. Um, we also engaged with um, Bristol City Council. Uh, with part of their One Tree Per Child project, where they take uh, inner city children to locations um, to plant trees. So um, we, we've chosen a farm along the pipeline route where there was uh, two areas of woodland that needed to be connected. Um, so we gave up a buffer, buffer zone of woodland between the two, 
and we also created another small woodland area um, in the corner of one of the fields that uh, was not used. Uh, in total, we planted over a thousand trees with ten schools, uh, so, you know, three hundred children came out. Some of which hadn't left the city centre before, and had certainly never visited a farm. So it gave them a great opportunity to come out and experience the countryside and, and, and do some tree planting, which is great. And the picture at the top there also shows that um, some of the Bristol Water and the, the Kia senior management team came out and joined in as well. So uh, not just the environment team, but but everyone involved, which is great. Uh, we also did pond pond enhancements. Um, there were dozens of ponds along the route, many of them with great crested newts. Um, we, we highlighted three that were in serious need of, of some attention. Um, one pond was so thick with invasive plants you could walk across the top of it. So uh, we spent the day with the um, local community group cleaning the pond out, um, removing the invasive plant, replanting it with, with suitable plants. Um, and within, I think it was three or four weeks, we had evidence of great crested newts laying over some on, on the autumn that we planted. So uh, a nice success story, which turned around very quickly. Other ponds needed uh, reed removal and things like that. We've also been back to surveying and shown that new populations have increased from that as well. So that's great. Um, bee orchids. Uh, we had a very large population of bee orchids in one of our rural villages we, we passed through. Um, there was, because of the, the, the way the highway is set up there, we had to, to run through the area where the bee orchids were. Um, one of the local um, community was very keen on every year recording and marking out the, the orchids, so that made it a lot easier for us. We were able to lift turbs, take them away and bring them back. Where there were less orchids and it wasn't worth lifting the turb, we took individual plants out uh, and potted them up and they were looked after. They went on tour to the local farmers market, they went to the Bath and West show, the Avon Wildlife Trust and we used it as a, a visual aid and something to discuss with, with, uh, with local people or being replanted back on site. Um, so lots of engagement opportunities. Um, as I said previously, we employed local people. Um, we had lots of volunteers come to us uh, to work on the projects. We couldn't have done it without volunteers from young ecologists who wanted to come out and gain some experience from members of the public who were interested, um, from, from community groups and parish councils, it was great. It was a, a very much a community effort to, to do everything. Um, working with schools, um, colleges and, and local universities as well was, was great. Um, and it, it kind of brought the whole project together in one, which was, uh, was a great thing. And there's lots of things here that I haven't mentioned, the water saving techniques for, for cleaning the pipe once it was fitted, say 20 million litres of water, um, reuse of material on site, say 13,000 tonnes, the use of stone from compounds, so 20,000 tonnes, the, the numbers go on and on, so the project is, was massive and, and had an amazing effect on, on the, more than just the, the, the local community. Um, and I think the one thing it, for me was, was great was that we didn't have to spend a fortune um, or, or to, to deliver this, um, basically we spent less than £2,000 um, on, on buying materials to, to do these things. Um, there was a cost, obviously, to the staff time, um, which Peter recognises, but that was matched by volunteer time. Um, it, it equated the same amount of volunteer time to the staff time we put into this. Um, and, and there's a whole list of things there, which you can see over 500 children engaged in the project, over a thousand trees planted. Um, and it, it, it snowballs and goes on and on. Um, and it, it doesn't have to cost a lot to be able to do things. You just need to have the imagination and um, a bunch of willing people. So I would certainly say make use of a free workforce. Um, there's always people that want to get involved with stuff. And if you've got some nice ideas and you can promote it in the right way, they'll, they'll come and help um, and they'll enjoy it as well, which is great. Um, so I would say don't just do one thing, do one thing and then help it grow um, and then try and do more things as well. Uh, that's that's what I'd like to say, so thank you very much and I'll pass you back over. 
Great, thank you very much, Jamie. And our next and invite uh, uh, Duncan Kramer of Green Roof Shelter Limited to uh, to be to to join us and run us through his presentation. Duncan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. So okay. This is uh, just a quick explanation. Really, this presentation is a quick explanation of what we do, and it ends up with uh, the entry we submitted. Uh, and that's won the Innovation Award, so hopefully that's useful as well. Uh, the first slide, the next slide is uh, what we generally are known for, which is uh, green roof cycle shelters, and we also make bin stores, we've made locker shelters, any uh, external storage space that deserves a proper biodiverse gr uh, growing roof on it. Uh, the next slide, I think, will be uh, bin stores. Uh, these are small ones for wheelie bins. We also make them for Euro bins and larger. And uh, what gets exciting about these is when there's a series of them going into a space, they start to create uh, quite a bit of protected space that's raised away from uh, random herbicide spraying and things like that. The next slide is uh, cycle shutters that have gone into IKEA at Greenwich for their new store, which is part of their uh, bid for Briam Outstanding. I'm not sure if they've achieved it or, or not, but I know that they've, that's what they're making a lot of effort to try and achieve. So that's one uh, good way of getting good interventions into a, into a job. Um, the next slide is how we deliver them, which is they're always made off site, so they're completely finished. They're planted according to uh, generally what is, is needed locally, sometimes in consultation with a wildlife trust or ecologists. Uh, the reason they're made off site is that uh, trying to get around having to do lots of site work because that's obviously makes things uh, more complicated and expensive. The limiting factor with that is that they are they have to fit on a on a lorry and be lifted off. But I mean, they're still quite big things. They're very, they tend to be very heavy. Our roofs, because they're what I would call a proper growing roof, they weigh uh, 20, 225 kilos per square meter when wet. So they're, they're normally a two, two ton structure. The next slide is the typical uh, sort of roof planting and habitat. The, 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 something that's significant to us is that uh, green roofs are very important, but also creating nesting opportunities uh, close to the forage is very important. So we always provide solitary bee nesting, uh, also nesting boxes for birds, and uh, we quite often, when, it, when they're going into places like schools or community groups and things like that, we'll put in habitat panels that have things like sheep's wool so that you actually get to see birds taking nesting materials so engaging people with what actually is going on uh, the next slide i think is probably bird boxes yeah so that's uh, one of our bird boxes the second the first well, actually i can't see on this the first or second o in roof is actually the, the hole for uh, blue tits the next slide i think will probably actually show us exactly that um, that's uh, I guess just try, trying to engage people and enliven people with what's going on. The next slide is our typical planting. No, it's not. That slide there is uh, so sparrow boxes. So uh, when you've got social nesting birds, uh, creating nesting opportunities for those as well. The next slide is. Uh, planting, we we have a, a a mix of plug plants and seeds that we use that's evolved over time. John Little is actually that, uh, there in the photograph. He's got a great deal of experience in this, having been making green roofs for twenty plus years. Uh, and we also have some uh, test beds, I guess you'd say, where we where we keep uh, monitoring the substrates we're using and seeing what actually is uh, being affected by by what we, we we according to where things are going so uh, some
greenwood shelters went into an area where they wanted to encourage bog plants so we raised the uh, outlets the water outlets in the roof so that it will actually hold more water we can do things like that um, next slide uh, the, I would say one of the most significant benefits is that uh, residents get to look down on something much better than a typical asphalt roof. Um, even if you do get, you know, you sometimes do get things thrown up onto the roofs and things like that, but uh, compared to a barren uh, roof, it's a much nicer thing to look down on. So even in the summer, obviously, you get a, you can, in, in droughts, you'll get things being scorched and a lot of things dying back, but you always get a flush of new growth when the rain comes and you get quite a development over the years of what actually is growing. Things change, you get a lot of things being blown in and uh, nothing too, generally anything uh, quite big tends to uh, get, get scorched off uh, when there's a hot summer, so you don't tend to get any uh, saplings and things like that, don't last long. Uh, next slide is we always provide uh, information panels just to tell people what's on the roof. The, the ro roofs are you know, quite low compared to on being on a building, so you do get to see a uh, lot of the planting, but it's also important to tell people what is actually on there or what might be on there and why. Uh, what what the purpose is? The, the purpose is to encourage pollinators and provide habitat and forage and nesting. Um, next slide. That's a little bit more detail. Uh, the, the reality is is that the, the plants do change quite a lot as to in, depending on where they're going. But it's it's this again just indicating to people what things are really about. Uh, the next slide, I think, is, yeah, this is our sister company, the Front Yard Company, where we make smaller uh, green roofed bin stores at a domestic scale. All the, the, the other uh, green roof shelters tend to be for new developments, housing estates, estates schools, things like that. For, but for domestic environments or for, for new developments where it's at an individual level, we make green roof, uh, uh, we make bin, uh, bin dock a green roof bin store and the next slide is this is something also the front yard company makes which uh, is a, a long-standing cycle parking product that we've made that uh, gets more uh, plants and therefore insects onto the streets and i think the last three slides the next slide is this is the entry that we actually uh, made these are the really just trying to give an idea of what we submitted that then went on to win the innovation award so i think that the important thing i would say obviously there's, there's quite a lot of putting trying to pack in quite a lot of detail into into our our entry i, I think we started by taking simply the questions that were asked and trying to answer them and then I would say that the other important thing must always be that uh, images are very important when uh, presumably the judges are having to read tons and tons of text and images are some considerable relief, I'm sure. I think that's what I've got to offer. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Duncan. Um, just a quick reminder to anybody listening in that you can ask uh, either Jamie or Duncan a question if you'd like to. Just use the question box and we'll, we'll go through those at the end. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Derry, who's going to run, uh, run us through his uh, presentation. So, Andrew, are you there? Are you there? I am. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Andrew Derry, um, I'm the Development Director at LaSalle Investment Management uh, where I'm responsible for overseeing uh, larger, more complicated property developments that we do. Uh, typically we will um, outsource um, to external development managers but uh, in the example um, that uh, we have here, was this was one that we did um, ourselves direct. Um, I'm also a member of the LaSalle European Sustainability Task Force and co-authored the LaSalle Sustainable Development and Refurbishment Guidelines. Uh, LaSalle is a, a global fund management company uh, with about 50 billion uh, sterling uh, assets under management. There's around 13 billion um, in the UK. 
Uh, we have a, uh, an environmental, social responsible or social responsibility and governance policy. Um, and that um, has um, a goal to minimize environmental impact on clients' properties, uh, also our own um, business operations, uh, delivering best solutions to clients by meeting and exceeding environmental regulations and requirements, uh, collaborating with stakeholders to ensure optimal sustainability solutions, and also a drive to be innovative on sustainable property investment. Um, at a more local level, um, for some time now, uh, we've certainly been very focused um, on environmental issues. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that we have uh, largely focused on trying to uh, reduce um, consumption of, of, of power and resources um, and trying to minimise uh, the impact on um, environment. So green leases, uh, which is something that uh, we look to do on all of our uh, properties when we're leasing buildings. Uh, building a uh, better buildings partnership, um, which is um, where we are engaged with the industry at large. Um, Gresby, recording fund level sustainability and sustainable management program, which is a way of managing energy, carbon, water and waste. Um, we have um, a, a 10 point uh, um, plan for uh, sustainable building management, uh, which is the document uh, on the right um, and the one um, on the left um, is in fact the front cover of our sustainable development refurbishment standards uh, which we are currently looking to update so um, born business park um, phase three significantly uh, was completed in january 2017 uh, the site was originally developed as industrial for the aeronautical industry uh, but was demolished and has laid fallow uh, following earlier phases that were developed in the late 1990s. Uh, the site comprises around five acres and had outlined consent for a single 90,000 square foot building uh, with a, um, a historic but exceptional car parking ratio of 1 to 20. Um, coming out of the last recession in 2013, um, there was renewed confidence in the market uh, and uh, we recognised the need for speculative space in the M25 Western Corridor. Um, and that time, as I mentioned before, we decided we'd actually manage this one um, direct ourselves. Uh, the brief to the project was actually to deliver two buildings, uh, which we felt was uh, more appropriate for the market at that time. Try and maintain the same car parking ratio, which we managed to do, uh, add a cafe um, and maximise the amenity space that was provided by the site's proximity to the River Bourne and also Greenbelt land, which had impenetrable woodland on it. Um, and we thought um, that it would be a rather nice idea to try and open up uh, these areas uh, to create um, space um, and a path and give access to nature for tenants to enjoy. The other thing we did was we targeted to achieve Briam Excellent, which we achieved, and also EPCA on both buildings, which again uh, we achieved. Um, I think it's fair to say there were no significant planning hurdles um, but we're very, very keen to maximise the environmental credentials. Um, as, well in, as well as winning the Syria Award, we also won the BCO Best Commercial Workspace Award uh, for uh, 2018 uh, for the South of England uh, and Wales. So the next slide, um, I'm trying to sort of capture um, some of the initiatives uh, that uh, we explored um, as part of um, very much a, a thrust to uh, take advantage of the, 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 the environment um, that, uh, that we had and to sort of try and see how we could make um, some enhancement. Um, I'm just going to go through some of these slides just to give you a sort of a, a sense. I'm not going to read these out, um, but uh, essentially where uh, we were able to enhance the um, environment. Um, it's part, in fact, of an audit that we had um, ARC, um, our ecologists, um, prepare for us um, just to sort of appreciate uh, um, what the um, benefits um, um, were of the scheme that we undertook, um, where, in fact, they were able to identify um, 93 um, insect species, 78 plant species and 28 bird species. And the highlights uh, were 17 species of butterfly and day-flying moths, 
eight species of uh, dragonfly and damselfly, and also the presence of kingfisher, uh, which was uh, particularly exciting. Um, the intention of this audit is that we'll continue to monitor biodiversity uh, and we'll be doing um, our annual audit. Um, and one of the initiatives was to find and in fact identify uh, other opportunities for further enhancing biodiversity. Um, so it's very much um, a, a live project and something that in fact uh, we're looking to get tenants um, actively um, involved with um, um, as they enjoy that amenity space. Hopefully they're also going to take um, an interest in it as well. And I have to say, uh, when I visited the site uh, with ARC, uh, it was uh, absolutely um, the best day I think I've ever had in the office, uh, walking around um, this green space um, with Ian and Claire pointing out uh, the, the, the dynamic of uh, the various different species of, uh, uh, um, of the uh, damselfly flying over from the, uh, uh, the river and feeding on pollinators. I mean, it was uh, uh, quite extraordinary, um, some of the things that were happening. Uh, so, you know, we were um, delighted with with uh, with what we've uh, um, achieved. Um, uh, I'm not sure if uh, um, if that uh, bin store is one of Duncan's, um, but I've, I've I've taken the details down, Duncan. I mean, I think what you've done there is uh, exceptional, and maybe one for next time. Um, I think the immediacy that we have um, created has been. Um, a, a something of a, a USP for our development and we've had extremely positive feedback from the occupational market and from incoming tenants. Uh, the scheme has performed extremely well uh, and achieved headline rents of £35.50 per square foot um, which is well ahead of, um, of our underwrite so we're delighted with that. Uh, I think it's fair to say there's been something of a, um, uh, a delay in, in, in attracting uh, tenants um, and, uh, and we put that down to, it's the, it's the other B word, I'm afraid, um, dare I say the word Brexit. In terms of uh, this project, I would say, and it has been confirmed to me by colleagues, it's been an inspiration um, and also coincides with uh, the South's desire to be investing responsibly. Um, we're currently working on a uh, forward thinking uh, biodiversity strategy for our existing assets. Uh, we're, for example, piloting um, a biodiversity project at the Glades in Bromley, which is one of the shopping centres that we own, um, and also another shopping centre in Stuttgart. Um, uh, we're also looking at uh, retail warehouse parks, converting grassed areas into biodiverse gardens, um, and on an industrial scheme that I'm working on at the moment uh, in Snodland in Kent, uh, we're creating a biodiversity park on part of the site. Uh, we're also, as I mentioned before, working on updating our sustainable development guidelines and BOR will be very much um, a, an important case study. Um, uh, there will be a biodiversity section uh, which ARC is um, helping us with, uh, which will be a significant, significant part um, of that document. Uh, this is what the judges said, um, um, which um, I have to say we're, we're very, very uh, proud indeed um, to have uh, um, had that uh, recognition and to have been uh, awarded uh, the, uh, the Biodiversity Challenge Award. Um, I would say that um, uh, winning it has, has definitely had a significant impact on me. I'm very, very proud to have won the award. Uh, I have to say, though, credit must go to ARC, who really did uh, make all this uh, possible, uh, but also uh, for the rest of the project team, and I'd say particularly the architect T.P. Bennett, uh, the landscape architect McGregor Smith um, and the building contractor Volker Fitzpatrick. Um, I'm very excited to be working with ARC going forward to make sure that uh, we are net positive in terms of biodiversity for all of our development projects going forward. Um, and I'll also mention um, that um, we posted our achievement uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, this might mean uh, more to some of you than it does to me, but uh, targeted 6,600 LaSalle followers, and we got 3,069 impressions, 19 likes, a 2.51% click-through rate, uh, which is the percentage of people that have clicked on the post out of potential reach. Uh, we got one comment and three shares, 77 clicks and 3.26% engagement uh, rate. Um, and I have to confess that one of the shares was in fact uh, our European uh, chief executive, uh, Simon Marison, 
um, who got um, 12 likes, which he was uh, particularly happy about. Um, and at the end of the day, if the boss is happy, uh, then we're all happy. And that concludes uh, the presentation. Thank you. I hand you over to Rosie Wichlow from the London Wildlife Trust, who's one of this year's judges. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to um, listen to my presentation today. Um, my name is Rosie Wichelow, um, Principal Landscape Ecologist at London Wildlife Trust. Um, and uh, my presentation today is, is really um, the judges um, kind of big tips really on what we would um, tell you um, to try and make the best um, kind of stab at um, applying for the award um, for the big by the best challenge. So um, just moving on to the next slide. So who are we? Um, well, we're um, here are some of the pictures of the judges that have been involved over the last couple of years. Um, they represent a really wide range of um, people in different professions related to um, Syria. So. Uh, some people have a sustainability background, um, some in environmental um, management, um, in ecological consultancy. Um, we have a couple of people who are from charities like RSPB and the Wildlife Trust like myself. Um, and it's, it just represents um, a really good collection of, of experience um, and knowledge for the, for the industry. So, you, you know, your, um, your applications are reviewed by you know, experts, really. So it's worth knowing that. Um, and myself, I've been a judge for possibly the last couple of years, um, and that's been a great process. Um, um, and so, you know, keen to help uh, you guys, you know, do what you can to, to deliver the best um, application and, and have the best chance of winning. So moving on to the next slide. So my tips for you today really um, are quite simple. Three big tips, um, essentially based around big as it, the word, so B for beyond, I for illustrate, and G for germinate. And it is really that's just that simple. Um, and we're going to go through each one of these in turn over the next couple of slides. So next slide, B for beyond. Recognizes, so B for beyond recognizes the value in leaving a positive replicable legacy. This is really important and I think um, a really key difference with the Syria Big by the Best Challenge in comparison to other competitions or um, award, awards you might go into, it really recognises the importance of that replicable ability. Um, I hope I can say that properly, but um, it's, it's, really, um, it's really important to try and identify ways that we can really deliver by the best you gain um, and, and in a way that can really help other people do it as well. So that's the, the value of the replicability. And the, also there's an importance in the legacy as well. It's not just about the tokenistic approach anymore. It's really about delivering net gain long term. So it re, it's really important to keep um, those two words in particular in, in your mind when you're thinking about the project you want to enter and also about what information you have at hand to put in your application form. So next slide. So for beyond B for beyond, the judges criteria really takes into consideration these two words. Um, the project enhancement that must go beyond normal business practice, that's really key. So for any project you have, you will have if, you know, requirements for planning or for uh, policy obligations or um, construction you know depending on what the client is expecting from you and it's and it's really important that you consider doing that one extra thing so it's not about doing your normal day-to-day -day job well although that's still really important it's actually about identifying and recognizing doing additional benefit and the value of that again number two recognizes the importance of replicability so finding an enhancement that is really easy for other people to to do as well this is important because you know there's there's always going to be fantastic projects out there um you know unique situations really unique uh, locations you know there's no way you can replicate that easily you know it, it takes a really particular combination of factors they'll get awards for other things for other award for other situations but this is about the everyday the the normal the normal bread and butter work and what we can do to help improve that 
um, legacy, so the importance of creating something that's, that's ecologically valuable in the long term. So that's, that's trying to really recognise the importance of delivering that. And that, that kind of requires you know, a little bit of thinking, a little bit of planning, some skill. So, you know, obtaining ecological advice from a consultant or a local wildlife trust, um, some monitoring and reporting. So that's that's what that's trying to get get um, get recognised is the value of that. Um, and then the last one is all about the delivery. So sometimes it's really, you know, you've got a great project and you really want to send it in for um, an award. You think it's got some really great uh, attributes, but if you go in too soon, you, you know, you can't actually illustrate the delivery of that enhancement. You can't know whether it's a real success. You don't know who um, who's benefiting or, you know, what species are benefiting from the enhancement that you've done. So sometimes it's better to wait and go the next year. So that's, it's about recognising, you know, just when you should do, when you should apply as opposed to just applying as soon as, you know, you, you think the project um, is ready. So that is the key tips for B for Beyond. Now we're going to look at um, I for Illustrate. So I for Illustrate, a picture is worth a thousand words and we all know that term or phrase very well but it's really easy to you know think if you're busy or rushed for time and you've got this application to fill in you know you can very easily just you know, throw in reams and reams of information and not really think about it, just hope that, you know, within that text, there'll be some kind of nuggets of information that the, the judges can kind of look at and, and, and see, you know, the value of. But um, I can't stress enough how important it is to really think about what you're saying um, and really, you know, uh, keeping it down to the minimum, i.e., you know, illustrations and images are really key to kind of get across what you want to deliver. So, the next slide, um, when you're writing your submission, just bear in mind these four key tips. So less is more. We have very limited time as judges to assess your application. It's something like three minutes per application, which is really not very much, and you might be annoyed by that, but um, essentially, if you're going for a, top, for a subject or a category which is really popular, like the temporary enhancement or the pollinator enhancement or small scale project those ones are really popular there's lots of entries sometimes 30 40 of them so if we've only got three minutes and we need to assess your application amongst lots and lots of other projects we really need to make you really need to make your application as as vividly memorable as possible so a great way to do that is through illustrations it's really quick to for us to understand the information, to capture it, to to memorise it, and then when it comes to discussing between top, between projects, we've got that kind of visual image of some of the the information that you gave us. So just bear that in mind when you're writing your application. Um, again, you, you know when you're you're trying to illustrate your story, so use testimony, use images and examples that kind of explain your story. That's really key. Um, Make sure you also think about the question. So, you know, it is about tailoring. It's not about just ch chucking a whole lot of words down and hoping some will make sense. It really is about trying to tailor it. And I can't stress how much, like, how much uh, benefit it is to to just not put too much word, too many words down. So, even though there's a maximum limit of say, you know, a thousand words, don't or five hundred words. I can't remember what it is, but um, it, you know, less is more. Um, don't feel you need to fill the page. If you if you can get everything down in half the amount of words, brilliant. That's all we want to hear. Um, so, um, and last but not least, ask for a second opinion. So, if you've got an opportunity to have a colleague read your application, or um, a third party, say a local charity organisation, or an, your consultant ecologist, great. They all can really help to just give a sense of perspective on your application and to kind of just draw out things you might have missed or repetitions in the information. So I can really recommend that too. So that ends um, the key tips for I. We'll mo now move on to G, so our next slide. So G for germinate. So to really end 
with the best and the most important really here is the story and more importantly your story is really really important um, and is worth its weight in gold so moving to the next slide so think about the narrative that you're trying to tell us this is your project or the project of your your team we, w we really want to know how how it happened you know how where did it where did the idea come from was it a person in the team was it a local um community member was it a child that you you know um that you mentioned that mentioned something in a school trip you know all of these things really make your your project stand out as being unique and different and thought about um and i think just as a general point um it is generally the most successful projects um do are able to convey a passion behind the project so um, it's just worth worth knowing that um, and can't stress how important and how useful testimonials are in kind of um, bringing that third party conviction that your project's been really successful so that ends the G for germinate so very simply there is B for beyond so to recap, Beef Beyond, does your project leave a positive replicable legacy? Illustrate, are you able to illustrate your your project or an application in in as many pitches or relevant pitches that can depict your project in sim simple, easy to understand and memorable ways? Um, then that'd be great. Um, G for germinate, um, please tell us your story, um, it's worth a lot in us understanding how and 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 the benefit of it um and just with all those if you're able to to think about those while you're writing your application um they really help particularly the last one in identifying possibly um the big biodiversity champion individual um which is someone who has gone over and beyond their their call of duty so to speak in helping to deliver biodiversity gain um and that's um and that's really valuable to 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 celebrate and to reward those people that really do go beyond so that really is it that's our big literally big biodiversity tips for you um just finally um if you uh if you liked the presentation but you'd like to know a little bit more then i've done a blog uh, which is on the syria big biodiversity challenge website this is just um a snapshot of that present of that blog um and my my picture there so um do go along and read that if you're you're interested and that's that's my presentation so thank you very much for listening and if you have any questions um i'm more than happy to answer any um or if you just contact your local wildlife trust or consultant ecologist, I'm sure they will be very happy to help. So thank you. Okay, we haven't had um, any questions, so um, I'm going to close down the webinar now. But just uh, just a reminder, we look forward to seeing your entries uh, for the Big Challenge this year. Uh, you can go to uh, bigchallenge.info for all the information uh, you might need. There are also wealth of case studies of past entries on there, absolutely hundreds of them. Uh, you can view all of the entries uh, so you can get some ideas and inspiration from there. And that's it. Thank you very much.